Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Lee Newman grew up in Anchorage, Alaska and Baltimore, Maryland, traveling between the homes of her two parents. Her remote wilderness experiences led to her award-winning memoir, Still Points North. She received her BA from Stanford University and her MFA from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I'm very excited to talk with her today about her newest collection, Nobody Gets Out Alive, which is just out and one of the most anticipated books of 2022. She's also been awarded a 19, I'm sorry, a 2022 award from the Paris Review's Terry Southern Prize for humor, wit, and sprezzutera. Thank you so much, Lee, for coming to the Storyteller's Microphone. You were the first person I've ever spoken to that, that pronounced that word correctly in Italian. You're Everybody kidding. else is like, spezzeratura. I mean, it just goes like, <laughs> Spots of la papa. You know, it's really <laughs> like Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but let's get out of the way the fact that the, your novel, your new book is called Nobody Gets Out Alive, and the fact that my face is a mess has nothing to do with that. But it is such an anticipated book. I didn't want to put today off, and I had a minor fall, and let's just jump right in. Okay. So welcome again. Well, we've all had those falls. I mean... We Especially in Alaska, like actually one of the, you know, what commonly happens is there's so much ice that you fall in the driveway and then you either go backwards and break your back or you go forwards. And there's a lot of women actually, this is in one of the short stories. It's an older woman who is afraid of falling and then they try and stop themselves with their hands and they break their thumbs. So having two broken thumbs is a common winter energy, uh, uh, in injury up here. And you're coming to us today from Alaska, from your childhood home. So thank you for that. You're yeah, cool. I am. It's a shame that I didn't pull up this blind, but it, you wouldn't be able to see me because of the sunlight. But I'm actually in my childhood bedroom where just below in my yard, there's this little spot where moose always come, even though we live in a, you know, a regular suburban looking neighborhood with suburban houses. Um, uh, the moose come down all the time and feed right in this one spot. They have been for 40 years, ever since I was a baby. And they, they, you know, they, they lie down and take a nap in the exact same spot. And they go, they relieve themselves in the same little area of turds by this blue spruce tree. That's, that's heart. wonderful. That's a wonderful thing. I <laughs> want to talk with you about your entire scope of writing. At the storytellers, we always like to know the story behind the storyteller. And you write essays articles, fiction, memoir. Is there a place you're most at home? And tell us about those different ways of writing for you. Um, I always wanted to write fiction. So actually the nonfiction was a deviation from what I was trying to do. Um, I had like written short stories, you know, through my 20s. And um, I just think maybe it was allied to a, to a not knowing who I was, you know, and being so influenced by other writers. I was actually not writing about what I knew so much. I wasn't writing about Alaska. I, w I think I was trying to be brilliant and funny and maybe a little mean. I was writing about, you know, I think I'd read too much Updike. I, I, I think that I just picked the wrong track. But and he's then, such great fuel for all of our writing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Everybody right? needs some Updike, yes. Right. Um, you know, but I'm just, yeah. And so I, I think that I was writing out the wrong things. I was, th I think I had, a, I think I had good voice and I had good sentences, but I wasn't telling stuff from myself that was different. Um, I think I was trying to fit in rather than be different. And that's like some high school leftover thing that I had, you know? Um, sure. And it is so important to find out as a writer, what makes you different? You know, most of us know it and it's connected to our art, but finding it on the page, right, is a real way. You know, that will make your writing, if you, if, if you go into that territory, your writing will always be unique and you won't have to worry about voice and you won't have to worry about all coming up with good ideas because it'll all be right there for you. And, um, you know, once That's I started writing, I wrote a, a flawed novel about Alaska, but I wrote it very well. And I realized, oh, I need to be writing about Alaska. And because the novel didn't work out, I didn't know how to write stories yet. I just said, I think I'll try a memoir because I don't know what else to do. Right. I've tried the stories, I've tried the novels, and I haven't, it hasn't worked. So I wrote this memoir, and it was so easy. 
You know what I mean? Like, I was like, oh, this is different. This is different. You know, these pe- you probably didn't grow up like flying in a single prop plane. You probably didn't go up hunting your own food. You know, you probably didn't sheep hunt when you were 16 on a mountain with your dad. You know, it was very interesting to like bring up this material and the, the writing itself to me felt beautiful and natural and full of de- vivid details and, you know, alive in a way that I don't know whether my writing has felt before. And I think you just hit on a couple of really key points that I'd want listeners to really think about. We've all been told, write what you know, but this is much deeper. It's a gut feeling for you as well. And then I'm also pretty sure I am never going to have another guest who can hunt caribou, you know, (laughs) load their own shotgun and then do beautiful (laughs) antique shopping at the same time. I know. I am a weird one. I am like, I have a hopeless aesthetic. It does relate to my writing too, which is like, I'm so concerned with sentences. I read everything out loud. I think deeply about like how to use a verb differently. You know, how many adjectives are on the plate? I love adverbs. I, everyone else has said, oh, no, adverbs. Well, I, I want to bring them back. I think, you know, there's certain things that, you know, the the uh, there's these cool kid rules of, of writing that are, I think, you know, it doesn't have to be spare. You know, my writing is very rich and it's very extravagant. And part of finding my voice, which I really found in this last book, this is the, you know, that's when I realized I love fiction. I want to write like this for the rest of my life was, you know, finding yourself through the memoir, right? But then finding your writing style. That's where I found my real writing style was through the stories because I had already written something that sort of was tasteful and followed the rules. And then I just said, oh no, I'm going to go all the way out there with this real, you know, it's going to be so vivid, you know, you're going to feel like, you know, you ran through, you ran through a Roman candle. And And I love that. I love that about your writing. Let's talk very specifically about Nobody Gets Out Alive because it's been anticipated, the thrilling collection, best uh, American short stories, a woman who has swagger. And I would tell you when I read it, there is texture, just as you describe it. You can feel it. You can smell it. Uh, There's a descriptor in um, Howell Palace and there's something about the smell. And I actually had to stop on the page and go, oh my gosh, I know exactly how he smells. So, <laughs> yeah, so he, he smelled, tell us. He smelled like line dried shirts and peppermint yes. soap. Yes. And yes. there was something else. I mean, I, I just read that the other night. I'm not that good. Um, I read that the <laughs> night at a reading. But um, I think a lot about that because I think also growing up in Alaska, you know, I spent a lot of time like on Riverbanks board as a kid, right? Like, my dad would be fishing and by hour five, you know, by hour four, I was like making mud pies, looking at grasses, rolling around. And, um, I think that gives you like a very earthy sense. And maybe that's just me too. It's like, I don't want to just read about the title of the menu of the food on the menu. I want them to go all the way in, even to the point of being preposterous. I mean, I guess, right. There's a line, right. There's a line before you want to just like, when you read a menu and you're like, fragrance of bergamot and you're like cinnamon (laughs) and you're like oh my god you're a jackass and then there's the real one where you get the you capture what something would taste like because you capture what it feels like that's not just like listing ingredients that's listing feelings or reactions animal reactions to food or animal reactions to smell or animal reactions to color or animal reactions to people meeting them the same thing should go into your characters right they should have an inner something. I don't even think of character anymore as, you know, you read so many bad books where they were like, she was five foot three and she had blonde hair. I mean, who cares? I mean, you want some of that, but you want more of the person's vibe. Yes. yes. How do they Absolutely. walk through the world? And that's, and that's how, when you meet someone, right? That's how you decide whether they're going to be your friend or not. Right. In many ways, like yeah. over time you watch their actions and that will affect your friendship. That's the storytelling, watching their actions. But when you meet them, that's when you make these decisions. Am I interested or am I not? And why? So you have this amazing collection of stories. Why short story and not a novel? Interested in that. Um, and then talk about the individual yeah. stories because they are so rich. Oh, God, here. I'm going to show the cover. This is what it looks like because I actually love this cover. I do, too. I, I, think, it was, I think, you know, we worked so hard on this cover. Um you know, they had set me something more traditional and then they came up with this great boot print with all these mm-hmm. women and animals in it. 
And then, um, and this gets into why I write short stories. And then they had like 15 different colors, you know, and many of the colors were like a tasteful blue, a lot of colors that they use on women's writing, you know, like mm-hmm. this is a women's little collection. I just loved the red. To me, it felt like it, it, it said blood. And I feel like I wrote these books kind of in my own blood. I'm not, I don't mean to be gross or graphic, not in a horror way, but like everything that I've been waiting to say, you know, for 45 years, I could finally say Um, in some way, the, the form of the stories, the setting and the time period of my life all coalesced to have, to, to allow me access to what I wanted to say. (laughs) You know what I mean? And that's not always true. Like sometimes, you know, like, that's why I felt like this book was super special. And sometimes I wonder if it wasn't the form also, because I had tried to write several novels after the memoir and it had been made clear to me that, you know, that's what people should do. And I would get to about page 100 and I would think, do you care? Done. Yeah. You know, this is really good writing. And I don't, I just don't believe in writing for writing's sake at all anymore. I believe in story. I actually really believe in story. And by that, I mean such high emotional stakes, such investment of heart, right? And structure, put into a structure that you want to turn the pages, not because there's a barn on fire or someone's dying, but because you just care about what's happening. Like, and that there's some mystery, whether it will work out or not. Will the marriage stay together or not? Will she get the grant or not? You know, will the bear fall through the ice or not? I mean, you could put a million things in that, in that scenario and they don't have to be um, exploitive or clickbait. They can be as simple as, you know, a little girl who's can't find her favorite pencil. Will she find her favorite? If you make that emotionally rich enough, you will care whether the girl finds her pencil or not. You know, I think short, yes, I think short story, at least for me was a lost art. I, I, I read it a lot when I was in school, you know, that was something we did. We took a course in short story or when the teachers were trying to get us to do things, we had short stories, but I have grown just in the last year. My idea of genre has changed so much as well, but your book particularly opens the joy of short story of, first of all, it's short. So if I don't have the time I used to have, I can go in and dive in and have this full, rich, deep, texturized, if you will, experience. And that's, I will tell you, the cover of your book, I looked at it and went, oh, that's a boot. And then I went, right. oh my I know. God. I know. It now took me a minute to, because even some of them, hold on, like like even some of like, there's a wolf in there and there's a backpack. I mean, there's so many different things in this boot yes. print. This woman who did it, it was just a genius. I mean, I really was like, I could have never imagined that. But that's all good art, right? I could have never imagined that. But when you see it, you're like, that's perfect. You know, all good art is like that. About the short story form, it's like, I really love that you're saying that I'm getting a lot of that back too from readers, that they are busy in this. Like, I specifically made the stories like mini novels. So yes. like a traditional short story is like 17 pages. Mine tend to be like 30, 25 to 30. But I'm packing a lot more in there, right? Like, and I'm very judicious about what I include. So I don't want any filler. And for it to feel like a novel, that means you just got to pack those paragraphs with detail and description and emotional stakes. So it all feels, you know, really moving forward. And then secondly, I also, not intentionally, it wasn't like I planned it, but I w- every time I would write a story, I would fall in love with one or two of the characters and then I would give them their own story. So all the characters are living on a lake in Alaska um, and it's a suburban lake. Not, a, not unlike the lake I live in, but I just made a special name for it. Mm-hmm. But um, you'll see the people as a child on that lake, and then you'll see them at 40 years old getting married. Or you'll see them at 67 here, and then their neighbor at 25 trying to find a girlfriend. Or you'll see their grandmother in 1915 settling Alaska. So um, I kind of wanted it to have each story to feel like a novel, and then there to be like a novel echo, even though it was stories. Yes, it's kind of a subtle thing I was doing, but that makes the book more fun to read. Because when you pick up the story, you go, oh, I remember Janice. You know, now she's traveling up the Alcan to Alaska. In the last story, she was knitting at the party. You know what I mean? With with the mastodon skull in the living room. It makes it so rich for you. Yeah. You know, some people, uh, I think one of the most difficult things authors do is write in dual timeline. 
Yeah. The, the vehicle of the short story allows you yeah. to do that, I think, seamlessly. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't plan it. It was like, that is one part of writing is instinct, right? And I will say one of the parts that of me finding my voice and finding like, you know, just this energy and vitality in writing is honestly abandoning a lot, not all of my intellectualism, but a lot of, a lot of it. And just saying, this feels right. I'll figure out why it's right later. Right. And then knowing when this feels wrong, you got to stop immediately. Because I think a lot of my earlier career, I would feel wrong and I would try and convince myself that it was okay. And I would literally waste years. You know, I go, mm, you know, well, yes. and then so I would say, no, 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 it's all finally <laughs> keep going. But I don't think that's true for me. Well, it may not be true for your soul, but let's recognize the fact that you've been in the New York Times, Vogue, Harper's, <laughs> O Magazine. We're not talking about my little local paper or your no, local no. paper. You have had a remarkably successful um, writing career. So regardless of whether it has been your most authentic voice. No, but I mean, I'm saying that to other writers, you know, like I worked on a novel and I knew that there was a problem and I kept going. So now that I embrace knowing when I, I can go on instinct without any justification for what I'm doing, or I can stop on instinct, even though everything is telling me mentally that this is just fine. It's like reading to better work. I'm wasting less time on things that don't work. I'm spending more time on things that do, you know, and, um, I think it's hard to find that, that, that instinct in you. It's like, I think I found it honestly when I had my kids and I had to interview babysitters to help. I had these babysitters to come help me 20 hours a week so I could mm -hmm. write. And I'd sometimes like meet a wonderful candidate and they would say one thing and it was little ding would go off in my heart. And I'd be like, I can't work with her. Okay. This isn't going to work. We're too different. You know what I mean? Like I see like, oh, she, she, she can't roll with it. You know what I mean? Like she needs all the silverware in the silverware drawer. That's not going to work at our house. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> in our house, you can find silverware in the washing machine. I mean, okay. you know, like you got to be able to roll. But um, oh, anyway, yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, I spend a significant amount of time writing. I, I, well, you show it, it shows because you know there are a few art. Uh, there's a few authors that I've spoken to. Claire Fullerton uh, comes to mind right now, where she says every sentence has to shine, and you I say the totally same thing. I totally agree, one hundred percent. I can hardly move on to the next sentence until I have that sentence correct, because so much also happens. I mean, and when you really get into the nitty gritty, it's like, how do you get from the last word? of this sentence to the first word, how do you leap over that space in the period? You know, we don't want to have too many of the same kind of clauses. We want to alter rhythms, but alter rhythms in a way that reflects the emotional content of what's happening. Like if someone's in a, in a rush, maybe you want staccato short sentences, right? If someone's looking at something languorously, maybe you want long, more flowery, but you're constantly massaging all these things. Some of it's instinct and some of it's experience, but a lot of it's like, relentless focused attention to what you're doing oh, word by word. I, I love that. I also want to talk to you about kind of an overall theme of your work. It's very much to me feels like you're navigating the terrain, navigating the terrain of relationships, navigating the terrain of marriages, your personal story, finding your voice. Is that right? It is. I mean, I'm what, you know, what I was telling everybody was like, I sort of found this phrase that it's a lot of what I'm doing is like survival domestic in the sense that sometimes the stakes are heightened. You know, there are moose or a grizzly bear or someone's in an isolated cabin or there is a blizzard, but the same issues come up. And this is actually totally what happens when you're in these situations, the flaws in your marriage come out. You'd think you'd be arguing over, um, you know, are we going to live or die? What you are going over is like, God damn it, we only had one can of beans and you didn't bring the can opener because mm -hmm. you always forget everything. You're know, like, that's the kind of marital argument right. you have mm -hmm. where your kids are going to punk out on you and they refuse to help and you're questioning the whole way you raised your kids. I just feel like these are settings which you see are totally different, but they reflect the circumstances are different, but the way that we question things is almost universal, right? Especially when it comes to women, which is a lot of what, I mean, that's why there's a woman on this cover. You know, I'm really interested in women that are very strong, very independent, but also 
especially Alaska, this happens when you're surrounded by men. They're like, oh, she's so strong. That to be weak almost seems like, A, impossible when it's not true. Of course, we're all weak inside or we're sensitive or we, we have needs. And then B, you have to deny it, right? Until it all collapses, you know? Um, so this, this huge dilemma between being tough and independent and being able to be alone and being fierce and doing great in your career, being a great mountain climber, whatever that, whatever that translates versus to, I'm still somebody who, you know, it gets lonely. I'm still somebody who would like, really like you to say, it's all going to be okay to me after we lost all of our money or something, you know, I'm making up scenarios, um, or I really would need some help. Like, I feel like, um, right now women are just put in this position. Like when I watch a movie, it's like, I'm going to put like Charlie's angels. I know this is an old movie, but like, you know, you watch these women and not only are they thin, not only are they fit, not only are they geniuses in solving the mystery, and they're also like doing like martial arts at like inhuman speeds. Mm -hmm. and, you know what I mean? And then they look, you know, and, and you know, and then they, and then they have a child, you know, like the expectations, even when you go on Instagram, it's like, I'm very much interested in the, the portrayal of strength. And then the reality of what it actually be is to be strong. Um, oh, I, I love that. And that's where this spread to terror comes in, correct? Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. I know yeah. what it means. And I, and I grew up Italian. So why don't you tell our listeners, though? Well, I thought, it, I mean, maybe you should tell me because maybe I've mangled it. I'd love to hear what it actually is in Italian, you know. Well, it, it, may, it means two things. One is to make it look easy. You know, you do something, you know. I think some people would look at your career and say, oh, she's been in the New York Times and Harper's and Vogue and, you know, she makes it look easy. Um, people say that about my podcast, you know, yeah. you make it look easy. So there's that sort of elan or panache or self-confidence where it does, just looks easy. But the other side of it is another intriguing part for me. And it's that idea of not really letting anybody know what else is going on so you know you may be doing <laughs> that is totally me the thing is it's like and i know a lot of women are in this like you know i i like in college you know i would go to the party or whatever and socialize right then i would yes. go home at one and i would read and study till five in the morning right and then i would get up and go to class but never discuss it never say oh i worked so hard the truth is i work really hard all the time you know I'm not trying to cover up for any things. I think also like when I get out of bed in the morning, I don't want to talk about how hard I work. I want to have as much fun as I possibly can. And I'm not joking. Like I love to have fun. You could give me a pile of dirt and a, and a, and a carrot. I would have fun with that. You know, um, <laughs> that's why I loved having kids, you know, cause I can sit around and watercolor nothing for like three hours and then I can fill mm -hmm. the bathtub and splash around with them and call it playing. You know, teenagers are not so, are a little hard for me because uh, they, they don't are. want to do those but, things anymore. But um, but I, I think that's also the, the way I approach writing too, right? Like I'm working really hard, but I don't want you to see all that just because you and I are right. talking about adjectives and we're talking about this. I want it to read supernatural. I want the voice to be all that work goes into me. It's like composing, right? When you talk to composers, how they try to achieve a sound, um, you, you do that, but it should be buried. The writer should be unaware of it at all times, unless they're a writer who, read something like this and is interested, I mean, who listens to something like this and is interested, how do we build it? You know? Well, we're going to have to all strive for much more spread to terror. It'll be a new yeah. name for a new word for everybody. I cannot believe Lee that our time is over. I hope you will oh. come back with me on the storytellers. Oh, anytime, because this is actually storytelling is the fundamental basis of why I write. I've realized it's not to be smart. It's not to reinvent the wheel. I actually so believe in storytelling and we need to get rid of the word plot and go back to storytelling and then we're going to find our 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 focus about why people are going to read more or not read more you know absolutely tell people where they can find you oh um i'm on instagram at lee newman lives i'm always there uh, I'm on Facebook as Lee Newman and I'm on Twitter at, at Lee new. I'm not, I'm not as good at Twitter guys. I'm saving my words for my, for my books, but I will, I will eventually meet you there if you need me to be there. I also have a website, Lee-Newman.com. It's very easy. To find. And, 
Everybody has to get a copy of Nobody Gets Out Alive and find a new love for storytelling. Lee, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Grace. That was wonderful. This has been a copyrighted episode of The Storytellers by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air, Global Radio Network. Thanks for watching. That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. Because when our stories are told, everything changes. I'm Grace Salmon.